Thank you so much for your film. Um, you, your piece weaves together so many different threads. So I thought it might be helpful to start by hearing a bit about your research process and kind of how all of these different stories came together. Can you hear that feedback? You're okay. A little bit. It's, it's one of these very large questions, and I um, I actually, to maybe instead of directly answering it, I was thinking about um, when people often ask artists who work with nonfiction, like, what's the research process, or what's your method, and how does that method, you know, overlap with, um, uh, I don't know, the social sciences or other ways of working with nonfiction. I, I started to try to think more about like mantras and what, what are situations one finds oneself in and what are the circumstances one finds oneself in that you then pick and then you then focus on certain things within your parameters, um, which for me implies more, for me, a linear, it's a less linear of a process that way. So, but I would say that in a way, um, I start with perhaps it's a conversation or someone tells me something and I, I listen to someone else and someone tells me something else and I start to have my ear being kind of grabbed from place to place, from idea to idea. And then within that, I, um, I sort of find threads. But quarries, which you saw, um, is probably over the course of uh, eight years, you know, and I've made other things in the middle of making this, right? So oftentimes, um, and oftentimes works don't pan out, you know? So the eolits, which is probably, you know, chronologically the first thing that came up, which was these prehistoric stone tools, which are erroneously uh, thought to be the, you know, the beginning of evolution in England. And um, that would have been a, probably the first footage, although that was maybe eight years ago, and I didn't really know I was going to make something like this that you saw eight years later. So the eolits became um, one thing that I parked for many years. And with all my works, there will be kernels that will show up in other works. So I don't know, maybe some of you saw Gyres, which was my last work. And again, the eolits are in there barely when I'm walking with Angela, the archaeologist, and we're walking through the field. We're actually looking for eolits, although I don't mention them in Gyres. But we start having a conversation, and the conversation is about, um, I'm telling her about volunteering in Lesbos with uh, people coming ashore, and she tells me about um, a story she heard on the BBC about an um, uh, Egyptian man who was responsible for burying people who didn't make it across, and he couldn't find enough stones anymore to bury people with, because that was the tradition. And so part of my process is to have to let go of what you think is going to be the final work. And um, so, for example, I filmed Angela for two years, and in the end, it was two minutes of conversation that I used in gyres that became, you know, the thing. You have to let go of all the labor. And it's the same in quarries. Uh, you know, there are um, were pieces and puzzles that I was trying to get in there for a long time, and uh, it all it finally landed eight years later, yeah. I'm curious um, because the way you tell the story, it, it makes me curious how the writing came together, if it was in relation to the images or um, if you're kind of plotting out the narrative and then, you know, I imagine it's a little bit of back and forth, but yeah, can you tell us a bit more about the text in relation to the image composition? Um. Well, I think for me, there's a back and forth between text, like I guess, you know, Gertrude Stein wrote quite a bit about this, like the idea that the text that's meant to be spoken versus the text that's meant to be read. And my process is always kind of going between the two. So as I'm sure many of you know who are engaged in any sort of writing, oftentimes when you tell something to a friend, you know, in an informal way, it's very different than when you sit and try to write that out, you know, whether it's long hair or a computer. Um, so I had been trying to compose quarries for about two years, and I um, really felt I had these very different, you know, narratives happening. 
I do quite a bit of dispatching, which is something I find really key when I'm, when I'm in places and I'm working in places. The idea of stepping out of yourself enough to write a, a quote-unquote letter back home, you know, to, to decide I'm going to collect my thoughts today and I'm going to try to harness the mindset I'm in now because those become the breadcrumbs that one uses later on when you're no longer in the mental space of, say, the Calzado workshop or walking, um, you know, walking into this archaeolog- this anthropological um, museum or trying to write in that moment. But then, of course, it does become you know, a palimpsest of time periods. As you can see in quarries, it's, there's many different times going back and forth. Like George's, you know, I say he's dead at the beginning and then he's dying later on. And so there's a kind of uh, time that there's echoes. Um, and that often comes from then leaving, I leave a lot of voice memos for people um, when I'm trying to explain an idea. And I, I left a voice memo for a friend of mine and it went on for hours and I never sent it to him. But that actually became the roadmap for, for quarries. Um, where I never set out to, for example, to make a film that had my brother in it or the book club. The book club was something I did. You know, it wasn't like I'm going to put these things together. But when I was trying to explain the conundrum of like, you know, how do I get from like, from essentially New York to Lisbon, um, from Stones in uh, Stony Brook University in Kenya to the labor on the sh- on the street, I know like thematically and philosophically why I want to be there. But how do I get you to go there with me? And so that sometimes happens in a very informal way when you're just telling someone like, you know, at a cafe or in a bar or in a voice memo, when you're not feeling so self-conscious of how it should all fit together. And so then I often really transcribe those and I have, I transcribe quite a bit. And then from there, it becomes much more of a tedious process of balance between types of narratives, yeah. I like that. I like thinking about these voice memos and almost like journal entries as almost like um, more materials that you're kind of grabbing along the way through the process as if they're images or something. Um, I want to hear about the, the triptych, the, um, the visual um, refrain that, you know, I think the fun aspect of it is when you break it or play with it in these different ways. And, um, yeah, I'd love to hear that more about that. In a way, I mean, that also is a type of circumstance or circumscri- uh, circumscription that one puts on, upon oneself. Of course, the triptych, which I really wasn't thinking at the time, has such an obviously heavy like Western art um, connotation. But I was really thinking about the parentheses, the literal a way a parentheses looks. And there's this line I really like um, in quarries when I'm talking about Karen, the photographer, and I say, you know, she wrote to me, the book was a still painful chapter in her life, and she wrote the word still in parentheses. And why I like that line is, A, I like the idea of calling the attention to this is a written correspondence, this is not a conversation. I like the idea of visualizing a parentheses. And I like the idea that the parenthetical, the, the, I would argue that Corey's is um, a group of parentheses, that there is no one through line. There are parentheses that are next to each other. We don't, we never know why. I mean, well, the viewer doesn't know why this book is a painful chapter in Karen's life. We never know um, uh, certain, you know, certain things, and, and, and purposefully it's withheld, right? Because the story is incomplete, and of course, we don't know the names of many of the the people who paved the streets of Kel- of um, Lisbon. So, for me, I was looking for a form that a visual form that could both remind me of the parentheses, so the three, but also this idea of flux and stasis, because it, that's quite pre- present also in the film. You know, you have the accumulation of images that almost become sediment. They get swiped away. Then we go into a live, what, quote unquote, live, like real. You know, um, I mean, it's an inadequate word, but you know, video, right? Like it's all video, obviously, but you know what I mean. Um, more like in the field uh, video. Um, we have like the flux and stasis between I'm moving freely through the world and my brother can't move. Um, we have the petrification of. Um, you know, of ideas that are, you know, slowly getting maybe overturned, like, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that, that was really w- the reason why I was going for the visual uh, look of that, yeah. Let's open up to some questions. Um, we have a microphone coming, yeah.
certainly, uh, you know, there's this moment in 45th Parallel, which I really liked when uh, the narrator says, you know, we have fiction in Canada and nonfiction or vice versa in, in, um, in, in the U.S. and you can go freely between the two. And I, I really appreciate that as a method, you know, this idea that um, one can kind of go between the two and sort of live within the border, you know. And it's something that I think about a lot with um, the uh, writer Donna Haraway in one of her books called Staying with the Trouble. This idea is how do you stay with the trouble? How do you, like for example, you know, with the calzada, you know, this this paving stone, you know, for, I find it exceedingly beautiful, right? It's a, it's a lost, it's a dying knowledge. Um, and in that beauty, you have, of course, you know, the unknown craftsperson um, leaving this small gesture, this small mark, you know, to say, hey, I was here, you know, even if you don't know me, even if you'll never know my name, even if you'll walk over this and maybe not even notice this, right? The small gesture of that. But if you flip that on its head, you know, this idea of the hubris of, of building monuments and, and, um, and covering things in stone, of course, the most grotesque is the fascist you know, monuments to the slave trade in Portugal, right? Um, and this idea that to stay with the trouble is to be, for me, the way I see it, and when I hope that resonates in quarries, is this idea that one can step on this pavement, have what I would say almost like the philosopher's stone portal, and not be afraid to also acknowledge that the thing that maybe is most, is, can be very touching about the human condition, if you flip that coin, you get something that's extremely harrowing about the human condition. And being able to stay within those two, um, for me, is an extremely important, um, yeah. Anyone else? I have another question. Um, I'd like to hear you speak more about kind of the performance aspect of the piece. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about your use of images that kind of go back and forth between moving image, the video, and then the um, transparencies. Um, and like, I love the part where there's on one side, there are the books that you're moving and then they become transparencies and you slide them in on the other side or, um, yeah, just like the way that you kind of choreograph the, the use of the images that kind of became, um, almost like other, like more objects that you like work with physically. Yeah. I, um, on just a very literal sense that really one of my first forms was doing performance work, basically narrative-based works that w could be anywhere from in a living room to a theater. And I'm always really attracted to that form. That's something that can be collapsed, put elsewhere, and it's also quite efficient to make, you know. So Quarries is filmed ultimately the ultimate despite you know the years or the many multiple locations. It's filmed in a, my studio in very simple conditions, right? And the idea of that, I find um, that economy is extremely important to me. And also the idea that, you know, the rhythm of how one speaks in relationship to the hand, how we compose how we speak in relationship um, to the hand, to the pauses, where do the images fill up that space where um, there's no words. And that for me is a very bodily um, comp type of composition. Like that can't be written. It has to be embodied, right? And in that sense, it's performative. Um, and of course, you know, these are, you know, one takes and um, I do it until I get it right, you know, and yeah. yeah. And yet, yeah, it's a question. I think, you know, I try, for me, I'm trying to get what I would think is like as close as what it means to be in the world. And, you know, you look at one thing, you think of something else. And I think within our own perceptions and our own way that we relate to material, to other people, you know, we have this swirling gyre in us of time and, and memory and, and lived experiences and experiences that are told to us. And so for me, like that, trying to keep that in play is extremely important. And I, uh, thanks for mentioning that photograph because for me, you know, seeing that photo, because I took the photo with the, you know, with the, the, the um, 
tree roots rebelling against the stone before I ever found her book. And so I was really shocked that, you know, of all the odds, it was the same place, the same type of shot. And then I realized, like, yeah, that, that's what time is. Like, you can't fake that. You know, that is, you know, how, um, that is what it, yeah, that, that it just, it, if it encapsulated everything for me of what it means to be in the world and, you know, you, you can, you can, put stone over everything but still the tree roots are going to try to push up and for me that was a very powerful metaphor into how we mine our own you know lives how we you know look at what's around us and how the surfaces can always be scratched you know and we don't always find the same thing every time right because we're oh we're not steady state state systems either right and we're constantly in flux so yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah, completely. No, completely. You know. Yeah, and also the idea that, you know, that last surface, this is something that in terms of research process that drove me quite a bit, is, you know, this idea like all these ideas of projecting onto the stone, right? Whether it's the early prehistoric person who is, you know, seeing the potential stone, a uh, tool in the stone to the prisoner. And it's, of course, it's not just in the Greek re-education camps that this would happen, like this idea that, you know, this one last bit of, eight, I would say, I hate to be overly poetic, but like agency, you know, that last bit of surface to draw on. Um, and yeah, I find that extremely powerful. And of course, as we know, and also, you know, the, and the stone is also a way to oppress, right? And so that, yeah, that shifting surface um, that seems to really be with us for, you know, for, yeah, time eternal, I guess, you know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. One last question. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, there's a mic coming for you. Yeah, I mean, I was delighted, of course, that people were laughing because there are parts that are funny. You know, it's like there are many registers, like there are many time periods and time ideas about time. You know, one finds humor and like, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty funny person, like, you know, like actually, you know. And I like for some of that to get in. Of course, it gets in a very subtle way. And I think there is, and this maybe goes back to performance because when I perform, I get really nervous when people don't laugh. You know, because I'm like, oh, they're they're feeling they're not feeling comfortable. So the fact that people were laughing today made me feel like, oh, people are feeling comfortable in this, you know, enough to to laugh a bit, you know. And and I think, of course, these are usually shown in installation. I'm not with people when they watch it. So I think being here today and feeling people's energy, I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad someone got that joke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because sometimes, you know, it, you know, that's the thing again about seeing with the trouble. It's like you can have a moment like this, you know, where um, you know, yeah, there are funny moments in it, you know, yeah, so I was very happy that people laughed, yeah, you know, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much, Ellie. Yeah. <laughs>